morning. My name is Rich Lusk, and I want to welcome you to Trinity Presbyterian Church today. I want to welcome you to the Lord's service. God gathers us together that he might give us his gifts, that we might return thanks and praise to him. Uh, that's really what the liturgy is all about. Uh, we don't come here just to give. We have nothing to give unless we first receive. And so we gather together that God might give us his gifts, and we return to him in thanksgiving and praise. Uh, that's what we're here to do today. Uh, I want to make a few announcements as we begin this morning. Uh, this is Memorial Day weekend, obviously, and so we are switching over to our summer schedule. Uh, that means we've got a break from Sunday school now until the fall. Uh, we are looking for Sunday school teachers uh, for when we start back in the fall. If you're interested in being a Sunday school teacher, uh, you can talk to Cameron Edenfield. I uh, remind you that uh, effective June 1st, we are bringing Cameron on staff. He'll be uh, part-time here at first, uh, and we'll have intern status. He'll be a paid intern for a while, but that's all with a view to him becoming our assistant pastor later in the year uh, after he passes through the presbytery process. So uh, we look forward to that with Cameron. But he's all, one of the things he's going to be doing is coordinating Sunday school. So if you're interested in being a Sunday school teacher, you can talk to Cam about that. Uh, our Wednesday schedule now is going to be a little bit different. We're not going to have the meals at 6. We're just going to start Vespers at 6.45. Folks are free to gather for dinner before or after. Uh, but we won't have dinner here at the church uh, for the summer. We'll start that back in the fall as well. If you're interested in helping out with that, you know, it's never too early for us to start planning for those fall meals. If you're interested in that, you can contact our church administrator, Michelle Stevenson. Uh, and she can help get you uh, set up for that when fall rolls around. Uh, a few other things there. I, I won't go into uh, details, but ladies, you can look at the women's calendar. There's an upcoming shower. There's, of course, weekly prayer. Uh, there's the weekly lunch. Men, you can look at what's there for you. Uh, the home fellowship groups will be on their own schedule for the summer. Some groups will continue to meet regularly. Some will have a more irregular schedule, but uh, if you're part of a group, you should be hearing from your group leader. If you're not part of a group and would like to get plugged in, certainly let me know and we, will, uh, we can connect you with a group. Uh, if you're visiting with us today, we are very grateful to have you with us. Uh, we've actually got a visitor information card there on the, that inside back page of the bulletin. Uh, that can also serve as a prayer request card if there's something you would like. Uh, myself and the other elders in this church to pray for. We'd be happy to do that for you. Uh, we're uh, always looking for ways that we can serve and shepherd you better, and that's certainly one thing we can do. Uh, the sermon this morning, this is Ascension Sunday, so we celebrated Ascension Day on Thursday, uh, 40 days after Jesus' resurrection from the dead. He ascended into heaven, so that landed on Thursday. It always lands on a Thursday. Uh, we celebrate that here every year with a service. We did that Thursday night. Uh, but this is, this is Ascension Sunday. Because a lot of churches don't have an Ascension Day service, it carries over to the, the next Sunday. And uh, we'll be singing some Ascension music today. Uh, I'm going to be preaching on an Ascension-related theme. On Thursday night, I preached on uh, the Ascension of Jesus in relation to his priesthood. This morning, I want to talk about his ascension in relation to his kingship. What does it mean that Jesus has ascended? Uh, what does it mean that Jesus is now reigning over all things? And we're going to be looking at Psalm 110 this morning, which uh, is just one of the most, obviously all of scripture is important, but it is certainly one of the most important psalms in terms of unlocking the meaning of the rest of scripture. As I'll talk about in the sermon, it is the most quoted passage in the whole Bible. Uh, the New Testament refers to Psalm 110 more than any other passage from the Old Testament, which is really remarkable to think about. So that's what we'll look at uh, this morning, because Psalm 110 is not nearly as well known as it should be. If it's the most quoted psalm, the most quoted passage from the entire Old Testament in the New, we ought to know it, right? Uh, but uh, it's one of those that is not that well known. Uh, but, but here's one of the things that I think will help you, sort of an interpretive key. Scripture gives us two great mandates. There's what you could call the creation mandate in Genesis chapter 1 that really defines the purpose of the human race, to rule and subdue the earth, to have dominion over the earth, to multiply and fill the creation with God's image bearers. Uh, you can think of that. It's called the creation mandate. We could also call it the cultural mandate. Uh, it's about building a God-glorifying civilization, and that's what Adam and Eve would have done. That was the trajectory God put them on had they not wrecked it with their fall into sin. 
The second great mandate that Scripture gives us is what we call the Great Commission from Matthew chapter 28, where Jesus commissions his followers to be evangelists, to go forth and to proclaim the gospel, uh, to proclaim his lordship and his salvation to every nation under heaven, and to baptize the nations and to disciple the nations. Now, what I have found is that Christians tend to fall into two camps, roughly. You have those who are most concerned with the creation mandate, with that cultural mandate, and they want to build a God-glorifying civilization, and that's what they're most concerned about. Then you have those Christians who really are focused on the Great Commission. They want to do evangelism. They say, that's what we must do. We must get out and spread the word. We must spread the good news of Jesus, uh, get to know people in your neighborhood, at your work, at your school, so you can share the gospel with them. That's what the Christian life is really about. What I think is really fascinating is that in Jesus, those two come together. Uh, Jesus is the one who will see that both of these mandates are fulfilled. Jesus is the new Adam, and so he's going to see to it that the nations are, well, I should, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Jesus is the new Adam, so he's going to be the one who subdues and rules over the earth. He's going to be the one who fills the earth, who builds a God-glorifying civilization. Jesus is the new Adam who undertakes that creation mandate to fulfill it. 1 Corinthians 15 makes that clear. But Jesus will also be the one who ensures that the Great Commission is fulfilled. When he says to his disciples, go and disciple the nations, baptizing them and teaching them everything I've commanded, before that he says, all authority has been given to me. In other words, I'm going to be with you and I'm going to see this through to the end to make sure that this happens. And so through Jesus, both of these mandates ultimately converge. You can't have a God-glorifying civilization in a fallen world unless the nations are evangelized and discipled. It's the discipling of the nations that produces the God-glorifying civilization. And so these two things go together. They converge in Jesus. And that's one thing that we'll see in the sermon today, that God calls us to both of these tasks, to fulfill both of these mandates. But standing behind that, guaranteeing our success, is Jesus himself. So, let's prepare hearts for worship. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Lift up your heads, O you gates. And be lifted up in your lasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in power. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you. I rejoiced when they said unto me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord.
Thirdly, beloved brethren, the scriptures teach us that whoever covers his sins shall not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them shall find mercy. Let us now humbly confess our sins as God's people, finding mercy at his throne of grace. is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. As the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Let us humbly kneel and confess our sins together. Rise and hear the good news of God's forgiveness. Brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, take heart. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Hearts up to the Lord. O oh Lord, open our lips.
Lord, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. Our Old Testament lesson is Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now we'll remain seated while we sing our Psalter lesson. lesson comes from the book of Hebrews, the first chapter, verses 1 through 14. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. 
They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? This is the word of the Lord. Let us stand and sing our hymn together. lesson is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 29 through 36. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. The Gospel of Christ.
Let us pray together. Father, on this day as we celebrate Christ's resurrection and ascension, may you fill our hearts with joy and peace in believing. Father, may you give us that joy unspeakable and that peace that passes all understanding because of what Christ, our great King and Savior, has accomplished for us, what he is doing in us and through us in the world, and what he promises to do at the last day. Father, strengthen us for the battle. Equip us for service in your kingdom. Make us into the kind of community, the kind of people you call us to be in your word. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do you have a favorite Bible passage or a favorite Bible verse? That may seem like a strange question in a way. Uh, after all, the whole Bible is God's inspired word. All of it is inerrant and infallible. Every last word of this book is God's truth to us. Every bit of it is authoritative. Every bit of it is revelatory. It is perfectly consistent with itself. So we definitely cannot pick and choose from within the scriptures. We have to be whole Bible Christians. Everything from Genesis to Revelation is God's word to us. Inspired by the Holy Spirit for us, preserved down through the ages for us. Leviticus is every bit as much God's word as Romans. The genealogies in First Chronicles are just as inspired as the stories in the Gospels. But I'd still guess that most of us have certain passages in the Bible we gravitate to, certain passages that we turn to more frequently than others, passages we regularly go to for comfort or for direction. Uh, most likely, there's, there, there's some passage of Scripture that figures more prominently in your life than others. Now, I don't know if it makes any sense to ask the question, does God have a favorite Bible verse? Because, again, all of Scripture is his word. But I'll tell you this, if God did have a favorite, Psalm 110 is a really good bet to be that favorite. Why do I say that? Because God in his word keeps uttering these words again and again and again. He keeps giving us the words of Psalm 110 again and again and again. Psalm 110 is cited in scripture repeatedly. Uh, Psalm 110 is quoted in the New Testament more than any other chapter from the Old Testament. Psalm 110, verse 1, is quoted or alluded to more than any other verse in the entire Bible. In fact, it's really astounding how often Psalm 110 shows up. It may not be the most famous psalm in the church today, but it certainly was the most famous psalm in the days of Jesus and the apostles. Just a few examples of how the New Testament makes use of Psalm 110, so you can see what I'm talking about here. In Matthew chapter 22, as the ministry of Jesus is rushing towards that climactic moment of his trial and crucifixion, in Matthew chapter 22, the scribes and the Pharisees have been hounding Jesus. They've been peppering him with questions, trying to trap him. And finally, Jesus has had enough of their questions, and so he asked them a question of his own. A question that comes from Psalm 110. When Jesus wanted to stump the Pharisees, this is where he turned. He asked the question, whose son is the Christ? And they replied rightly, the son of David. And then Jesus asked, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, and then he quotes Psalm 110, the Lord has said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Jesus asked the question, if David calls him Lord, how is he David's son? Now this is a puzzle, this is a riddle, this is a mystery, and because the Pharisees cannot answer it, because they cannot solve the riddle, they go silent, and they dare not ask him any more questions. They're going to have to take a different tack, a different strategy to trap him. Now, we'll talk about that mystery, that riddle that Psalm 110 gives us in just a moment, how the Messiah can be both David's son and Lord. Probably already know the answer, but we'll get there in just a minute. Consider some other places where Psalm 110 is quoted or echoed or alluded to in the New Testament. A few chapters later in Matthew's Gospel, when Jesus is standing on trial, false witnesses are brought in to testify against him. The high priest puts Jesus under oath, 
and says, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus seals his fate by answering with words that combine Psalm 110 with Daniel 7. As if to say, I am the one Psalm 110 was talking about and the one Daniel 7 was talking about. He says to the high priest, you will see the Son of Man seated on the right hand of power, that's Psalm 110, and coming on the clouds of heaven, that's Daniel 7, describing his ascension. Jesus is indicating that Psalm 110 will be fulfilled in his ascension and in his reign. And that is a theme that the apostles picked up on and continued. And when the apostles talked about this, more often than not, they turned to Psalm 110 to give them language to describe what it means for Jesus to reign as the ascended one. And so in Acts chapter 2, we read a portion of Peter's sermon there at Pentecost. This is right after the Holy Spirit has been poured out. And what does Peter do in the middle of his sermon? He cites Psalm 110. In fact, a, a good chunk of his sermon is, explained, is given over to explaining how Jesus has fulfilled Psalm 110 in his resurrection and his ascension and is continuing to fulfill Psalm 110 in his reign. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but I'm going to tell you, on that day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 enemies of Jesus were subdued beneath his feet and formed into a willing army of volunteers for him, all in accord with Psalm 110. It was coming true right before their very eyes. A little bit later in the book of Acts, when Stephen is murdered, his final words as he's being stoned come from Psalm 110. The Apostle Paul makes numerous references to Psalm 110 in his letters. Just a few of many examples. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, he alludes to Psalm 110 in describing the powerful reign of Christ at God's right hand. Or to take another example, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, as Paul is explaining the flow of history and how Jesus is subduing his enemies all throughout history with the last enemy of all to be defeated, death which will be defeated at his final coming. What does Paul do? Paul turns to Psalm 110 and quotes it to make his argument. When Paul wants to sum up his philosophy of history, where history is going, he turns to Psalm 110. The book of Hebrews cites Psalm 110 at least eight times. There are actually other echoes, many more echoes of Psalm 110, but at least eight times it's cited. In fact, the whole book of Hebrews may be considered a sermon based on Psalm 110. The book of Hebrews is exegeting Psalm 110. Several key arguments in Hebrews arise out of seeing how Psalm 110 is being fulfilled by Jesus. It's important to understand this, and, and I want to make this point too before we go further. It's important to understand that whenever an Old Testament passage is echoed or alluded to in the New Testament, the entire context of that allusion or that citation is being invoked. So even if a little piece of Psalm 110 shows up, just, just one little fragment of Psalm 110 shows up in the language of Paul or Stephen or whoever, really the entire psalm is being invoked. An allusion or an echo of a small piece of the psalm really calls to mind the whole psalm. In fact, you can kind of think of the way the New Testament uses the Old Testament. It's kind of like hyperlinks. Can okay, you know what a hyperlink is? If, if you're reading an article online and there is a link embedded in that article that will take you to another article, that's called a hyperlink. Okay? And if you click on that link, it's going to take you to this other article. It's going to take you to the whole article. So maybe just a small piece of that article is being cited in the article you're reading. But by clicking on the link, you get the whole article. Okay. That is a way to think about how the New Testament makes use of the Old Testament. When you see something from the Old Testament being alluded to or quoted or echoed in the New Testament, you need to click the link, as it were, and go back to the entire Old Testament passage of which that quotation or that echo is a part and, and get the whole context because that's really what's happening. So what do we have then in the New Testament? The New Testament is full of links to Psalm 110. Little bits or pieces of Psalm 110 will be cited. But every time one of them is cited, we need to click the link and go get the whole psalm. Because the whole psalm is being invoked. That, that's really what we need to see. The, we, and that's why it's so important for us to see what this whole psalm 
means. Psalm 110, you could say, to put it in modern lingo, Psalm 110 is the most frequently hyperlinked passage from the Old Testament in the New Testament. The New Testament is filled with links that if you click them would take you back to Psalm 110. So it is crucial for us to understand this psalm. So crucial, I would put it this way. We could summarize the gospel in these terms. We could summarize the gospel in this way. The gospel is simply the announcement that Psalm 110 has been fulfilled. Psalm 110 was the blueprint for the gospel, and now that Jesus has fulfilled it, we can say, that's the gospel. We can point to that and say, this is the gospel. Jesus fulfilling Psalm 110, that's the good news. That's what we're staking everything to, that Jesus is the one who fulfills this psalm. You could say the essence of the whole New Testament is this. The gospel is the fulfillment of this psalm. Psalm 110 has come true. And indeed, because Psalm 110 shows up so regularly in the New Testament, it's safe to say you really cannot have any understanding of the scriptures, certainly not any deep understanding of the scriptures, without understanding this psalm. And that means you really cannot understand what God is doing. You cannot understand what God is doing in your life. You cannot understand what God is doing in the world without grasping this psalm. This psalm is a key that unlocks many doors. This psalm is like beams of light shining into the darkness, driving the darkness away, scattering the darkness. It sheds light on everything, everything in your life, everything in the world around us. I would say one of the reasons the church today is so weak and so effeminate, uh, I think one of the reasons we see so much mission drift in the church today is because we don't sing the psalms enough, and especially because we don't sing psalms like this one. This is the most widely quoted psalm, the most widely quoted passage from the Old Testament. And yet how many of you, today was the first time you've ever sung Psalm 110? And we sang a metrical version, okay, we read it and sang the metrical version of it. It's not a well-known psalm. It's a psalm that's largely been ignored and sidelined, and that is to the church's detriment. This psalm really contains the whole Christian message in just a handful of verses. And if we get this psalm, if we, if we grasp it, if we understand it, it will make us strong in the faith. It will make us bold. It will make us courageous. It will make us confident. It will make us obedient. It will make us unwavering in our commitment to Christ and his kingdom. It will make us joyful. It's a psalm full of good news. This is the last Sunday in the season of Easter. It is also Ascension Sunday. And so Psalm 110 is especially appropriate for a Sunday like this because this psalm is all about the resurrection and reign of the Lord Jesus. It is a prophecy of his ascension and all that follows from it. It prophesies that historical event of the Psalter and all that comes as a consequence downstream from it. In other words, we're living amidst the fulfillment of this psalm right now. This psalm helps us to see that Christ is reigning right this very moment. I think a lot of Christians don't get that the way they should. Uh, a lot of Christians might pay lip service to Jesus as we sang about, Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But they don't really see what that means. They don't really believe it's true in a deeply historical and global sense. A lot of Christians seem to think the kingdom's been put on hold. Maybe the kingdom has been put on hold until that last day when Jesus comes again. And they, they might talk about Jesus' kingship, but they tend to treat Jesus' kingship as merely symbolic, kind of like what the British monarchy has become. You know, the Brits still have a monarchy, but no one believes that the British monarchs are really in charge. And some Christians, I'm afraid, think of Jesus' kingship that way. Sure, we'll pay lip service to his kingship. There's a kind of symbolic way in which he's king. But we, we don't really think Jesus is in charge of this world. Just look around. How can Jesus be in charge? We'll call him king, but we don't really mean it. We don't live like he's ruling all things. Or, just as bad, we privatize his lordship. And so his lordship becomes a privately held value for me, but it's not a public fact, it's not a public truth. 
It's not a reality that the whole world has to deal with. Now we privatize it. It becomes something that's, that's just true for me. And I don't know what's true for you, but this is true for me. Well, that's, that's just garbage. That's nonsense. And Psalm 110 certainly won't let us speak that way. Who is king of this world right now? Who is ruling this world? The right answer, the only answer to give to that question is Jesus. He is seated in heaven right now. He is reigning right now. He is God's right-hand man, ruling over all things. Everything is happening according to plan. And if you look at this world, and, and all you see is a mess, and it would be easy to do that, but I want you to think about this for a minute. What do you think the nations of the world look like from the Father's right hand? That's what Psalm 110 does for us. It gives us a throne room perspective a heavenly perspective on earthly history, earthly events. All authority in heaven and on earth belongs to Jesus. He is waging war. He is conquering his enemies. He is subduing his foes. Let's look at what this psalm has to say about all of this. This is a psalm of David, and I think understanding that it comes from David's hand is critical to rightly understanding it. Verse 1 immediately takes us into the deepest mysteries of scripture and I mentioned this just a minute ago with Matthew 22 what's going on here it is as if we get to eavesdrop on the father and the son we are overhearing an intertrinitarian conversation so verse one the Lord said to my Lord sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool English translation somewhat obscure this but two different words are used for Lord here uh, your Bible may have the first word, Lord, that first Lord in all capital letters. Uh, that is to let you know that that is Yahweh, which is the uh, name of God. That's God's name in Hebrew. That's identified with Lord in all capital letters. So here we can say this is God the Father. God the Father is called Yahweh in this passage. The second time the word Lord appears, when David speaks of my Lord, that is the word Adon or Adonai, which is a title. And that title can have a range of applications, but here it is, it, is, it is a title used for God the Son. And so, what do you have in this opening verse? Yahweh said to my Adonai, sit at my right hand. Yahweh is God. Adonai is David's Lord, so he is also God. This is the Trinity. There's, there's no getting around this. This is the Trinity. Remember again, this is the question Jesus raised in Matthew chapter 22. How can the Messiah be David's son and David's Lord? Everybody knew the Messiah would be a descendant of David, David's son. But in Psalm 110, David, said, David records a conversation that is spoken to, where words are spoken to, my Lord, David's Lord. The church father, Tertullian, had an interesting take on this. Tertullian said, in almost all the Psalms which prophesy of the person of Christ, the Son converses with the Father. That is, in these Psalms we observe the Spirit speaking of the Father and the Son. So we have certain Psalms where there is an inter-Trinitarian conversation between the Father and the Son that the Spirit has recorded for us, that the Spirit has given to us. Psalm 2 would be another example of this. That's what you have here in Psalm 110, Tertullian is saying, the Spirit has revealed this inter-Trinitarian conversation between the Father and the Son. That's what's happening here. The Spirit witnesses to the conversation between the Father and the Son and inspires David to record it. And so really what you have in the opening verse of Psalm 110 is the curtain being pulled back. The curtain on God's inner life is being pulled back. So we get to have a little peek. We get to, we get to have insight. We get to overhear a private conversation in heaven between the Father and the Son. That private conversation between the Father and the Son in heaven becomes a public conversation on earth because the Spirit records this conversation and inspires David to write it down. This is the record of a divine conversation, the Father making promises to his Son. Now, we could ask the question, how explicit is the Trinity revealed in the Old Testament scriptures? Obviously, you don't have the full-blown doctrine of the Trinity until you get to, to the New Testament. But there are plenty, there are plenty of hints and clues in the Old Testament that indicate that the one God 
Because remember, the Jews were staunch monotheists. The one God exists in three persons. The one God exists eternally in three persons, each of whom is fully God and each of whom is distinct from the others. And this psalm is one of those places where in the Old Testament you've got a clue, you've got a hint of something that will be more fully revealed later on. Because this psalm records God talking to God. How can God talk to himself? Well, the Trinity is the answer. This is an inter-Trinitarian conversation. And so, again, think about that, that mystery, that, that riddle, that puzzle that Jesus raised in Matthew chapter 22. The solution to the riddle really is the Trinity and the Incarnation. That's the only way to make sense of the question Jesus asks. How can the Messiah be both David's son and David's Lord? How can the Messiah be both David's son and David's Lord? Well, it is because he is both God and man. He is one with his father in godhood, and he is one with us in his manhood. He is fully God, fully one with the father, yet distinct from the father. And he is one of us, fully united to our human nature as well. Now, Psalm 110 is not the only place where you have this kind of Trinitarian and Christological mystery. Another passage that would be similar to this is Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah 11 does the same kind of thing when it describes the Messiah as the root and branch of David's house. Really it says Jesse's house, but that, that's the idea. The Messiah is the root and the branch of David's house. In other words, in some way the Messiah comes before David and after David. And the question there is, how can this be? How can the Messiah come from David when David comes from him? According to Isaiah chapter 11, well, again, the answer is that Christ is God in the flesh. Or to be more precise, he is the eternal son of God in Davidic flesh. That's what Isaiah is pointing to. So he is both David's Lord because he is the eternal God, and he is David's son because in his human nature he is born into David's family. So you can see why Jesus' question left the Pharisees speechless. Yahweh said to my Adonai, sit at my right hand. God the Father says to God the Son, sit at my right hand. Those are the words of the Father to Jesus in his ascension when he ascends into heaven. The one who was crucified and who has been resurrected ascends into heaven and takes his seat at the place of all power and authority the place of all rulership, the place from which he will reign, the Father's right hand. And so what happens next? Well, the God-man, Jesus, the Messiah, takes his seat on the throne in heaven. Again, that is an historical event. Uh, it's so important. You've got it at the end of Luke. Luke records it again at the beginning of Acts. It's this historical event. But then what? What happens next? After Jesus ascends and takes his seat at the Father's right hand, what happens now? Well, look at the end of verse 1 and, and, and into verse 2. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. The image here is of Christ's enemies being put under his feet. Christ waging war and the Father has promised him victory. And so his enemies are being subdued. His enemies are being subjugated. His enemies are being put under his feet. Think of Genesis 3.15 that describes the, the promised new Adam. The promised new Adam, the Messiah, who will crush the serpent under his feet. That's what's being promised here, that he will crush his demonic enemies under his feet. The conquering king is stepping on the necks of his vanquished enemies. You have a picture of this in Joshua chapter 10, when Joshua conquered the Canaanite kings and he said to the captains of Israel, come, put your feet on the necks of these kings. This will be symbolic of, of the conquest, the victory that God has given us, that God has enabled us to vanquish our enemies. And so, yes, the, 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 the reign of Jesus includes that kind of subduing his enemies, defeating and destroying his enemies. But I think there's something else going on here, and this is really crucial to understand because, again, it's one of those things that helps us understand what's going on in this psalm and therefore what's going on in the world around us. I think there's a double entendre here. Uh, that is to say there are layers to the meaning of what this is saying. It speaks here of a footstool. 
Jesus' enemies being made into a footstool for his feet. What is the footstool? What does that recall? Well, it's interesting. In Scripture, sometimes the Ark of the Covenant, okay, the Ark of the Covenant that was in the temple in the most holy place, sometimes the Ark is called God's footstool. And this is how you can envision it. Okay, if you've seen Indiana Jones, you've got a head start on this. Uh, or you've got one of those Bibles. Some Bibles have pictures or drawings of what the Ark of the Covenant looked like. That can help you with this. Okay? The Ark was like a box with a special lid on it. And on either side of the end of that box were cherubim that are angelic-like figures with wings. Okay? We know from various places and the Psalms and elsewhere that the wings of the cherubim form the throne of of God. And so if you think about God sitting on the cherubim, then his feet would rest on the top of the ark. And that was sometimes known as the mercy seat or the place of atonement. That's where the blood was sprinkled on the day of atonement, where God's feet rested on top of the ark of the covenant. In other places in scripture, so you've got the ark of the covenant, that's one way to think of, of the footstool. You've got other places in scripture where the temple as a whole, God's dwelling place, is called his footstool. For example, Psalm 99 and Psalm 132 call on the people of God to worship at God's footstool. What does it mean to worship at God's footstool? Well, it's a call to worship God at his temple. So the temple is the footstool of God, as if God is enthroned in heaven and his feet are resting on the earth. Elsewhere, the earth is called his footstool, in fact. So the temple can be God's footstool as well as the Ark of the Covenant. So what is Psalm 110 saying then? For God to make his enemies into a footstool, yes, it can be a way of describing him subjugating his enemies, destroying his enemies, but it can also be a way of describing the conversion and salvation of his enemies. He's forming his enemies into a footstool for his feet, which is to say he's forming them into an Ark of the Covenant. He's forming them into his temple He's forming them into his temple. He has subdued them, meaning he has made them obedient and faithful worshipers. And this is really important because there is obviously a lot of judgment imagery in Psalm 110. But you need to understand that judgment imagery is open-ended. God can subdue his enemies in more than one way. He can subdue his enemies in two different ways. He can subdue his enemies by destroying them, or he can subdue his enemies by converting them, saving them, making them into his friends. The imagery can go either way. He can make them into a footstool by destroying them or by converting them. And that's really one of the crucial keys to this psalm. Now, it goes on from there to say, the rod of his strength will extend out from Zion. Zion, of course, is Jerusalem. It's the place where the temple is. His, his strength, his reign extending out from Zion. This is to say he's not going to rule over Israel only, but over the nations. He will not just be king over Israel, he will be king of all nations, king of kings and lord of lords. It's to say all authority in heaven and on earth is being given to him. All kings, nations, and empires are under his lordship. And his rod is symbolic of his kingdom, symbolic of his power. And again, that rod is used to shatter his enemies and to extend his rule. And so we can say that rod brings judgment and salvation. Now, the picture you have here is of Christ as a mighty warrior, the one that the Father has enthroned at his right hand will fight these battles, and the Father has promised him victory in these battles. Christ is a warrior, but how does he fight? If he's seated at the Father's right hand, how does he conduct his military campaigns on earth? If he's seated in the heavenlies, how does he carry out his warfare on earth? Well, look at verse 3. Your people will be volunteers in the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. You have the dew of your youth. Consider those words. You will, your people will be volunteers. Your people, that is, the soldiers in your army will be willing. They will be so attracted to his beauty, to his holiness, to his life, to the dew, which is a sign of his strength. The dew is probably symbolic of his anointing with the Holy Spirit that covers him. The soldiers in his army will be so drawn to him, so loyal to him, they will willingly fight for him. 
His people will be volunteers in the day of his power. They will be willing soldiers. They will rush onto the field of battle for him in the day of his power. Now, of course, if, if you ask the question, okay, well, how do we become willing? How do, how do people become willing volunteers in Christ's army? It's only because Christ has made us willing. The Westminster Confession of Faith describes it this way. His Holy Spirit makes us willing and able to believe. The Westminster Confession says we come to him most freely being made willing by his grace. He has to make us willing. He has to make us volunteers in his army by his grace. But that's what he has done. And so this is describing Messiah's army. There are no mercenaries in this army. There are no slaves pressed into service against their will. This is an army of volunteers. Jesus may have drafted you into his army, but he did so by making you willing to serve. This means he has conquered his own people. He has subdued us to himself. He has conquered our own willful rebellion against him. He has made us willing. See, he is at work conquering the nations and making them his footstool. He is growing his army. And this is a process that unfolds over the course of centuries down through the ages of history. But this is what you need to see here. When the psalm talks about how Christ fights his battle, the one seated in heaven, how does he fight his battles on earth? It's important to see the church is instrumental in all of this. The church is instrumental in his warfare. The church is instrumental in this process of bringing judgment and salvation to the nations. How does he wage his warfare? It's through his church. We are the willing soldiers in his army. We are the means he uses to fight his battles. When this psalm says he rules in the midst of his enemies, that is to say he powerfully uses his church, an army of willing volunteers, to go confront his enemies on the field of battle. As we sang this morning, the cross is won the field. The cross will win. The cross will be victorious on the field of battle. Christ uses us, his people, to extend the reign of his kingdom over the nations. And this is why there is so much in the scripture about this antithesis, this warfare between God's people, between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. Ultimately, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers and forces of darkness in high places. We are the means Christ will use to win his victory. It is our evangelism, our teaching, our praying, our singing, our serving. As we do these things, Satan's kingdom falls. We have a role to play in this warfare. We have a role to play in the fulfillment of this song. And that's a glorious thing. Your life matters. Your life matters because your life is being played out on the battlefield of history. And you are a combatant. You can't help that. Everyone is a combatant in this great warfare. The question is, how are you fighting? Is your way of living your life really advancing the kingdom of Christ in the nation? See, we are living in a Psalm 110 world. Its fulfillment is unfolding all around us as Christ judges and saves. For 2,000 years, he's been sitting on his throne, doing his work through his willing army. And the ebbing and flowing of the kingdom of God over the last 2,000 years is largely due to the faithfulness or unfaithfulness of Christ's people. If you want to, if you want to speed up the fulfillment uh, of the fulfillment of this psalm, you want to speed up the fulfillment of Christ's reign coming to bear over the nation comes down to how we live. Christ is sovereign over everything, but he's going to use us. It's our faithfulness, our service, our fighting this battle. Christ is adding to his army as new recruits keep coming in, forming this willing band of soldiers. This is our calling, to give our lives, to weaponize our lives in service to the kingdom, this warfare. Verse 4 then goes on, the Lord Yahweh has sworn and will not relent. This is an unchanging oath, a permanent promise the Father has given to his Son. He says, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now there is so much comfort. If everything we've seen in this psalm so far is very challenging, there's a great deal of comfort 
in this verse. And, and really, this is basically a one-verse summary of what I preached on Thursday night on Ascension Day when we really focused on Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7 is a whole chapter given to basically unpacking this one verse from Psalm 110. This oath that the Father gives to the Son, that he swears before his Son to make him a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, it's mentioned at least five times in the book of Hebrews. And this is the point, and this is really what Hebrews does with it. Jesus is a priest greater than the Aaronic priests from the tribe of Levi, in Israel. The Levitical priest's work was never done, so they could never sit down on the job, but Jesus sat down at the Father's right hand because his work of making sacrifice for the sins of his people was finished. In fact, that's another contrast that Hebrews makes. The Levitical priest had to repeatedly offer sacrifices, not only for the people, but for themselves, because those sacrifices were not effective. But Jesus made a once and for all sacrifice that affected our salvation for all eternity. Another contrast that's drawn there, the Levitical priests died. They couldn't take away the curse of death. They suffered under it. But Jesus has conquered death and now ever lives to make intercession for us. He has an eternal priesthood patterned after the order of Melchizedek. He is eternally intercessing for us, eternally praying for us. That's a good thing to know that we have one who is praying for us at the Father's right hand, one who intercedes on our behalf, who knows our sins and our struggles and is constantly praying for us. That's good news. That is comforting. This priesthood of Jesus is based on the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a mysterious figure who appears in Genesis 14. And in his very brief and mysterious appearance provides the pattern for Jesus' own priesthood. He's only there for a few verses. You blink and you miss him in the story of Genesis. I like to say that he's kind of like uh, the Bible's version of Tom Bombadil. In fact, I would guess that Tolkien patterned the character of Tom Bombadil after Melchizedek. Uh, Melchizedek is important because he gives us the template for understanding the ministry of Jesus. Melchizedek was, was both priest and king. And in Jesus, both priesthood and kingship are rolled into one. He is the king of righteousness and peace, and he is one who has an everlasting priesthood. And in Genesis 14, he brings out to Abraham priestly bread and royal wine because he is a priest and he is a king. And of course, that's what Jesus does as our priest king. He gives us priestly bread and kingly wine at his table. All of this about Melchizedek is for our comfort. It's so we will know this is the kind of priest we have who is ministering for us in heaven right now. David then closes out the psalm with a prophecy of what the Lord Jesus as the great priest king will do in history, kind of picking up on themes he's already introduced. From his perch at the Father's right hand, from his heavenly position there, he continues to wage war, to pass judgment, and ultimately to get the victory. He goes forth conquering and to conquer. Verse 5, he shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the head of many countries. I think the flow of this psalm is really, really interesting. You know, we start off with this really deep and beautiful and profound inter-Trinitarian theology. And now as we move towards the end of the psalm, the bodies are piling up. Heads are rolling. And so again, we've got to ask, what's going on? Well, again, this is describing how Jesus brings judgment in history. Yes, there will be a judgment at the last day, a final judgment at the last day, but there is also an ongoing rolling judgment that happens all throughout history as Jesus exercises his authority over the nations, as he continually shakes things down, so only that which cannot be shaken will remain. But again, you've got to keep in mind the, the layers of meaning here. He doesn't just kill to kill. He can kill to make alive. He can kill the old man to bring to life a new man. He can kill a pagan empire to replace it with a Christian one. These are just the kinds of things we've seen him do in history, things he will continue to do into the future. How does he wage this warfare? Well, it's interesting. Uh, Revelation 19 gives us a, a picture that I think in a lot of ways is similar to Psalm 110. In Revelation 19, Jesus rides out on a white horse with his army 
an army of willing volunteers following behind him. So that's a lot like Psalm 110. And there, instead of a rod, he has a sword, but the sword comes out of his mouth. His weapon is his word. His weapon of warfare is his word. And he strikes the nations with his sword as he goes forth conquering and to conquer. How will Christ conquer the nations? Through the preaching of his word. At the end of verse 6, it says he will execute the head of many countries. This is a head crushing. Again, it recalls Genesis 3.15. The Messiah who will crush the serpent's head under his feet. Jesus will crush the heads of those who side with the serpent. He will crush the head of the serpent, and he will crush the heads of those who serve the serpent. But when you take all of this imagery together, again, yes, there's a day of wrath. There is judgment. Psalm 2 describes it this way, kiss the son lest he be angry and his wrath flare up in a moment. Same kind of picture. But he also judges the nations in history in order to bring them to their knees so they will repent. And that's a question we ought to ask, is just how much judgment will it take to, say, bring America to her knees in repentance? How much judgment will it take in America or in China or in Russia or in Ukraine? Because Jesus will bring judgment. And he will bring judgment. He will make things very, very painful for people who rebel against him. But for a good purpose. In order to bring people, in order to bring nations in order to bring kingdoms to their knees, bowing before him. The last line of the psalm is a fitting conclusion, whereas Satan's head will be executed and crushed, he will lift up his head. So you have a contrast. Satan's head gets executed. Satan's head gets crushed. The heads of those who side with the serpent, their heads all get crushed, but Jesus will lift up his head which is a, a sign of his exaltation, a sign of his victory. It says he will drink continually of the river or the brook. He'll drink continually of the river of the spirit to refresh him. He never grows weary as the battle of history rages on. The psalm says he will drink the river by the way. It's actually what it says, by the way. That word way there is the same word that's used in Psalm 1 to describe the way of the righteous man. Jesus leads us in the way of righteousness. He is the way for us. So Psalm 1 has a flowing river and a way, and Psalm 110 does as well. It uses that same kind of imagery, a flowing stream with a way. And I think that's there for our comfort once again. This is the warrior king taking Sabbath rest and seeking refreshment as he continues his warfare, and this rest and refreshment is for us as well. Now let me wrap this up. This psalm means a lot of different things all at once. This psalm gives us an understanding of what God is doing in our own lives and in the world. It gives us a whole philosophy of history. It gives us what you might call an eschatology, a view of the future. The reality is every Sunday, worshipers come into this church as they do every church with all different kinds of things burdening them, all different kinds of things uh, on, on your mind, different, different worries or fears you have, different burdens or struggles that you have. And look, let me tell you this. If today your main concern is with struggles in your own life, there's a sin you just can't seem to shake loose. It's just got its claws in you and you can't seem to break free. An addiction of some sort, or maybe you've got an anxiety that plagues you, a fear you can't get over. Or you're grieving some loss in your life, the loss of some good thing God has taken away from you. This psalm is a great comfort to you. It helps you understand what God is doing in your life. And the way it ends is especially encouraging. Jesus drinks from the brook by the way, and he invites you to drink from the brook by the way too. He offers you the refreshing, thirst-quenching spirit of God so you can keep going. That's really how this psalm Ends. And of course, it also ends with a promise of final victory over every enemy. So just as Jesus in the psalm lifts his head, you can lift your head as well. He wants to lift your head. He wants to be the lifter of your head. You can find comfort for your life in all the ways this psalm describes Jesus. He is your God. He is your king. He is your Lord. He is your priest. He is your captain. He is your warrior. He is your victor. Yes, he is the lifter of your head. 
And when you start to see that, no matter what you came in here today struggling with, no matter what was weighing you down, no matter what was on your mind or on your heart, when you see the truths of this psalm, you can go out from here knowing that you are equipped to fight the battle for another week. You can live confidently and boldly because you have this royal priest at work in your life. You can live with hope because Psalm 110 is true. Psalm 110 is the solution to all your problems. All your personal problems, Psalm 110 is the answer. But let's say you came in with something else on your mind and heart today, and your main concern was not so much something going on in your personal life, but what you see going on in the world around you, what you see going on in the culture in which we live. Because it really does seem like every week there are new disasters, school shootings and sex abuse scandals and unjust wars and wicked politicians. This psalm, again, is a place of comfort for you. Because it tells you about a royal priest who rules history, who judges and saves within history. A king who will bring justice and peace into his world more and more. In other words, Psalm 110 is the solution to the world's problem. And it's so important to see this. You know, Christians today like to, you know, we like to criticize, we don't, I shouldn't say we like, but we feel compelled to criticize so much of what's happening in our country. And rightfully so, because let's face it, it's, 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 it's falling apart and unraveling in so many ways. But it is important to remember that America's greatest problem is not political. That's just a symptom. The idiotic laws that get passed, the senseless violence we see, the, 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 the financial insanity that our leaders impose upon us, the degrading entertainment that streams into our homes, the breakdown of the family, all of these things are just symptoms of a much deeper problem. The real disease is spiritual. And a spiritual disease requires a spiritual cure. People who are alienated from God, who are at enmity with him, who belong to the darkness, who live in the darkness, are going to do dark things. And that's why we see so much darkness in our land. That's why darkness is covering the land, because people don't know the light. People don't know God. They don't know his truth. America is not going to be fixed by electing better candidates. The spiritual rot will still be there. The gospel of Christ is our only hope. The kingship of Christ described in this psalm is our only hope. Only the gospel can bring light that will overcome this darkness. Oh, sure, there are evil rulers in our land and in other lands. And in this psalm, Jesus promises to deal with them, to take care of them. And as his army of volunteers, his willing soldiers, we should resist political tyranny in whatever way we can. Anytime the state makes itself absolute and into a god, we ought to resist that. You know, the biggest threat to any tyrant are those three words, Jesus is Lord. Those three words, Jesus is King. Those are the words that strike fear into the heart of every tyrant. If there are evil rulers that need to be taken down, Jesus will do it. He will ultimately dethrone them. But to really fix what's wrong, we need a solution that goes down to the deepest level of who we are. We need everything to be made new. And in this psalm, that is what Jesus promises to do. Christ has won the great victory in history, and he will win many, many more victories until every last enemy has been put under his feet with death as the last enemy to be destroyed in his final coming at the last day with the resurrection of all. It seems absurd to people, even to many Christians sadly, to claim that Jesus will conquer the world. Say that and people will think you are crazy. And maybe it's even more absurd to say that Jesus will use his people, his church, as the prime agent and instrument to do this work of conquering the world. But to doubt that, that's just unbelief. The Father has spoken. He has promised a conquered world to his Son. He has promised to put all things under the feet of his Son. And his son right now is working and waging war to subdue the nations with the rod of his 
word. And so he can present at the last day a subdued world, a saved world, a discipled world to his father. The father has promised a saved world to his son. The son is determined to give a saved world to his father. That's our hope. As our priest king, Jesus will fulfill the great commission, baptizing and discipling the nations. As the new Adam, Jesus will fulfill the creation mandate, subduing the earth and filling it. One of the commentators on this psalm called this psalm, Psalm 110, David's creed, David's confession, David's confession of faith. Because this psalm summarizes David's beliefs and David's hope. I would say you can do no better than to make Psalm 110 your own creed and your own hope as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us continue our worship by giving of our tithes and offerings. Let us offer these gifts to the Lord in prayer. Our holy and triune God, for your glory and the advancement of your kingdom, with grateful, joyous, and faithful hearts, we present to you these tithes and offerings together with all that we are. Multiply these gifts and increase their usefulness. Magnify your name and purposes in their distribution. Continually increase in us the joy of honoring you so, and now set your blessing upon us all, supplying our every need according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus, in whose mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us sing of Christ the Lamb.
as God's royal priesthood, let us stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, you are a God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. You have established the throne of your crucified and risen Son forever. The scepter of his kingdom is a scepter of righteousness, and all his enemies shall become his footstool. When you exalted him at your right hand, you gave him the promise of your Holy Spirit, whom he has poured out to us that we might cry out to you, Abba, Father. And gracious Father, hear now our petitions on behalf of the church and the world. Heavenly Father, we pray for the Christians and the churches in Ukraine, especially our sister churches in the Syria Sea. As they face attacks from Russia, we pray that you would uh, strengthen them in the midst of their suffering. Uh, Lord, that you would uh, bring down the wicked uh, and that you would glorify your son uh, through all of this. We also pray for the church plants uh, within the Sierra Sea. Uh, we pray especially for Christ the King in Greenville, South Carolina. We ask that you would strengthen uh, their body there and bring them a pastor. Father, we ask for uh, your protection and kindness for all of our expectant mothers, for Tiffany Robertson, Mariah Brock, Jessica Scott, Claire Maddox, and Abigail Johnson. We pray that your spirit would strive with these covenant children, that they may know and love you all their days. Hear the prayers of those who desire to have children or are seeking adoption, and grant them the desires of their heart in your good timing. Father, we pray for the singles of this church, that you would encourage and strengthen them in the mission you've called them to. We pray for those who desire spouses, that you would bring them godly spouses. Strengthen and sustain our marriages, that husbands may cherish and lead their wives, and that wives would respect and submit to their husbands in purity and godliness. That our marriages would display the glorious light of the gospel. Give wisdom to fathers and mothers as they work to train and nurture our covenant children. May they grow in strong in the faith as children of light and persevere to the end. We ask for your mercy for all those who are sick or in need. Father, we lift up uh, Luke Miriam, Michaela Wells' brother. Uh, we ask for your mercy in that situation that you would bring healing to his body, that you'd give the doctors wisdom and skill as they care for him. And we pray, Lord, that you would glorify Christ in the midst of this uh, suffering. We pray for Teddy Fulmer and family, for Seth Scotchless, for Aaron Gray, Hannah Bourgeois, Robert Brown, and others whom we name in our hearts before you. Father, hear our prayers for all friends and family who are struggling with cancer, specifically Beth Booth, Mark Winstead, Michelle Taylor's father, Dean Spears, Molly Wilder, Jeff Love's father, Gregory Morris, Christy Myers, Eric Shelton, Pastor Alan Stanton, Ursula Bro, Julie McDonald's aunt, Sarah Ramos, Beverly Atwood, and others. Father, we pray that you would be merciful to and uphold the aging uh, who are in need of more care. We pray specifically for Jerry Hampton's mom, Linda, Mike Narvison's grandmother, Masha Pope's mom, Carl Peterson's mom, Laura Steele's mom, Sherry Hampton's mom, Rosemary Nettles, Noel Lightheart's mom, Kevin Fox's dad, and Ashley Hamblin's father. And now, Father, we summarize all these prayers using the, son, the prayer your son, our Savior, taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. Christian, in whom do you believe? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, 
begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, spoke by the prophets. <laughs> Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Holy things for holy people. The peace of the Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is very good and right that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Holy Lord, Father Almighty, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. But chiefly we are bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the very Paschal Lamb which was offered for us and has taken away the sins of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we praise and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. You may be seated as we feast together at this table our great kingly high priest offers to us. Let us give thanks. Father, we do give you thanks and praise for your son, for his great triumph accomplishing our salvation. We thank you that he offered himself as a priest and even now as our great high priest intercedes for us in heavenly places. And so as we take this bread, Father, we ask that you would Enable us by faith to commune with Christ, your Son, who gave himself once and for all on the cross for our salvation, who gives himself to us here at this table. We give you thanks and praise in his name. Amen. Amen. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and having blessed it, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. As we share this bread, let us sing together.
The bread is communion in the body of Christ. Let us eat together. And again, let us give thanks. Father, we do give you thanks and praise for your Son. Father, you sent him into the world on a mission of love to inaugurate your kingdom. We thank you that as the king of his people, he laid down his life on the field of battle to save us. And we thank you that on the third day, he rose again triumphantly, that he has defeated death and sin and Satan on our behalf. And now he shares this cup with us, a, a cup of covenant renewal, a cup of blessing. Because he drank the cup of wrath and woe, we can drink this as a cup of joy and salvation. And so through this cup, renew your covenant with us, O God. And even as Christ Jesus poured out his life for our sake, may we be empowered as we take this cup to pour out our lives for one another and for the sake of the world as well. This we pray, giving you thanks and praise in the name of King Jesus. Amen. Amen. Then he took the cup, and when he had again given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take and drink, all of you, for this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for the remission of your sins. Do this as my memorial. And as this wine flows out, again, let us sing together. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and have fed us with spiritual food and drink. In the power of Christ's body and blood, send us now into the world in peace, granting us strength and courage to love and serve you in all things, that we might do the work you have given us to do with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us stand and sing together.
Now look up and receive the Lord's blessing upon you. Go in the grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.